question of the origin of life has been one of the most debated topics in not only science, but philosophy as well. Most people accept evolution as fact, and that's good, but many still believe God played a role in the initial creation of life. Abiogenesis is the process of life coming from non-life, which was not even thought possible until 1952 when they performed the famous Miller-Urey experiment. The experiment was designed to mimic the conditions of what was thought to be early Earth. Although the experiment didn't create life, it did create over 20 different amino acids. Well over the amount of amino acids life produces naturally. The experiment demonstrated that abiogenesis was at least possible. Later theories state that it is more possible to find life forming near geothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, and that's not so far from one of the more recent ideas in science. Self-replication is a capacity common to every species of living thing, and simple physical intuition dictates that such a process must invariably be fueled by the production of entropy. In a recent paper, Jeremy England, a professor of physics, makes this intuition rigorous and quantitative by deriving a lower bound for the amount of heat that is produced during a process of self-replication in a system coupled to a thermal bath. We find that the minimum value for the physically allowed rate of heat production is determined by the growth rate, the internal entropy, and durability of the replicator. And we'll also discuss the implications of this finding for bacterial cell division, as well as for the prebiotic emergence of self-replicating nucleic acids. Every species of living thing can make a copy of itself by exchanging energy and matter with its surroundings. One feature common to all such examples of spontaneous self-replication is their statistical irreversibility. Clearly, it is much more likely that one bacterium should turn into two than two should somehow spontaneously revert back into one. From the standpoint of physics, this observation contains an intriguing hint of how the properties of self-replicators must be constrained by thermodynamic laws which dictate that irreversibility is always accompanied by an increase of entropy. Nevertheless, it has long been considered challenging to speak in universal terms about the statistical physics of living systems, because they invariably operate very far from thermodynamic equilibrium, and therefore need not obey a simple Boltzmann probability distribution or microscopic arrangements. Faced with such unconstrained diversity of organization, it is quite reasonable to worry that the particular mechanistic complexity of each given process of biological self-replication might overwhelm our ability to say much in terms of a general theory. For the beginnings of a way forward, we should consider a system of fixed particle number n and volume v in contact with the heat bath of inverse temperature beta. If we give labels to the microstates in this system, I and J, and associate energies, EI and EJ, respectively with each microstate, then the symmetry tells us that this relation holds at thermal equilibrium. Progress comes from recognizing that the heat expelled into the bath over a transition from I to J is given by the amount of work from I to J is equal to the difference in energies from I and J and moreover, that the quantity of temperature change in I to J is the amount by which the entropy of the heat bath changes over the course of this transition. The maximum net growth of a self-replicator is fixed by three things. Its internal entropy, its durability, and the heat that is dissipated into the surrounding bath during the process of replication. The less durable or less organized a self-replicator is, all things being equal, the less metabolic energy it must harvest at minimum in order to achieve certain growth rate. Thus, in a competition among self-replicators to dominate the population of the future, one strategy for success is to be simpler in construction and more prone to spontaneous degradation. A simple demonstration of the role of durability in replicative fitness comes from the case of polynucleotides. One recent study has used in vitro evolution to optimize the growth rate of a self-replicating RNA molecule, whose formation is accompanied by a single backbone ligation reaction and the leaving of a single pyrophosphate group. Since experimental data indicates an enthalpy for the reaction in the vicinity of what we would expect, 
It would seem this molecule operates quite near the limit of thermodynamic efficiency set by the way it's assembled. In this light, the relationship between durability and growth rate has an elegant description in terms of transition state theory. An activation barrier that is lower in the forward direction will be lower in the reverse direction as well. The key point here, however, is that whereas the relationship between free energy and reaction rates obtains only under local equilibrium assumptions, the inequality we have derived here, bounding entropy production in terms of irreversibility, applies even in cases where many degrees of freedom in the system start and end the replication process out of thermal equilibrium. We have glimpsed here that the underlining connection between entropy production and transition probability has a much more general applicability, so long as we recognize that self-replication is only visible once an observer decides how to classify the self in the system. Only once a coarse graining scheme determines how many copies of some object are present for each microstate can we talk in probabilistic terms about the general tendency for that type of object to affect its own reproduction, and the same system's microstate can be coarse grained using any number of different schemes. Whatever the scheme, however, the resulting dynamics must obey the same general relationship entwining heat, organization, and durability. England's theory is gaining lots of popularity among scientists and might help us come closer to discovering life forming in a lab or in nature. But until then, the universe is ours to explore. Keep searching. If you like the content, please consider dropping a like and subscribing to this channel. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter, and we'll see you next time.